Welcome to uh, Social Psychology. Uh, today we're doing the uh, second half of the, uh, the chapter on uh, groups. And uh, we're gonna start out by talking about minority influence. So when you're a part of a group, and uh, if you're in the minority, let's say, right? Uh, if there's only a couple of people that are like you and everyone else is different, or if, there, or, or if there's only one person or a couple of people who are, um, for instance, who have a different opinion from the rest of the, of the group, how can you be heard? How can you have some influence? This has many applications, right? Um, <clears throat> for government, politics, right? What if uh, you're in the Senate and your party is in the minority, right? How do you influence the majority so that some of the stuff that you want actually gets done? Or if you, or if you're in Congress, right? And you're in the minority, right? Or, you know, or you're a small percentage of the population, right? Whether you're uh, black, let's say, and you're 20% of the population or Asian maybe and you're 5% of the population, how can you have an impact, let's say on the college or politics, the country, whatever it is, how do groups that are not in the majority, how do they make they, their voices heard? How do they have influence? That's what we're gonna talk about, okay? So minority influence is when a numerical minority can persuade the larger group, right? To adopt some of their views and to make some of those things happen. So how, how can we do that? When is minority influence likely to be, likely to happen, okay? So minority influence is more likely when minorities hold steadily to their views. That means that basically you have your position, you have what you believe and you stick to it. You don't change your mind, you don't flip flop, right? You believe in something and you keep saying it, you keep believing in that, right? That's one way you can be influential. If you keep changing your mind, then they're not gonna pay attention to you or they're not gonna believe you, okay? So you need to hold steady to your view, right? It has to be something you really believe in, you're gonna stick to. Uh, they're also more likely to just listen to you if you once held the majority position. If in the past you were in the majority and you had that power, that authority that comes with the majority, um, then you can be more influential when you're in the minority. You know, just like, for instance, like in Congress, right? It used to be the Republicans who were in the majority and they were able to pass their laws, what they wanted, right? And now the Democrats have the majority. Okay, and now Republicans are the minority. The fact that Republicans are not a minority, but they were the majority in the past means that they can still be influential. Sides usually go, they usually go back and forth. Sometimes it's Republicans, sometimes it's Democrats who are the, uh, the majority, the minority. So either way, they have to listen to each other. Okay, because they've been in each other's shoes, so to speak. Right, and you can be more influential if you, if you have held the position of authority before. If you're willing to compromise a bit, it's, it, it's a good thing to compromise, right? You can find some common ground. That's been spoken of a lot in politics. If you can compromise in some issues, right? Maybe that are not the most important to you, but they're important to the other side and you give up some things, you gain other things, right? Then uh, you can get something done. If the minority, if you're in the minority and you uh, basically just want something done and you're not willing to compromise, you're probably not gonna, nothing's gonna happen, okay? You're not gonna have any influence. You have to be willing to compromise a little bit, give and take, so to speak for you to, uh, for instance, uh, have some influence. Now, if you're, in, if you're in the majority, you don't have to compromise, okay? If you're in the majority, you can pass whatever legislation, uh, do whatever you think needs to be done because you have the numbers, okay? But if you're in the minority, you have to be willing to compromise. You have to be willing to play nice, so to speak, give a little to get a little, okay? If you have at least some support from others, if there's at least some people on the other side who agree with you, you're more likely to be influential, okay? If you present your view as compatible with the groups, even though you're in the minority, you basically present your view and you say that, you know, this is not that different from what you guys want, the majority, right? It's really, we have the same message here. We want the same thing, but maybe we just disagree on how to do it, right? If you can present it as being similar, right, to the majority, right, what they want, then you're, they're more likely to listen to you, more likely to get something done. If you face a group that wants an accurate decision, decision, right, if you have a group that actually wants to do the right thing, you're more likely to have influence. Rather than a group that just wants to pass whatever they want to pass, 
because they're in control. And it doesn't matter whether the country agrees with it, other people agree with it or not, right? But as you guys know, politics lately have gotten very polarized. Whoever's in power, usually just they just do whatever the heck they want and they don't listen too much to the other side. And when the other side's in power, they will get what they want done. And that's where we're at as a country. There's very little compromise now. There used to be in the past, by the way, people were willing to compromise, but you know what happened to those people who were willing to compromise? They got kicked out of office. Their side didn't like them for giving in, for compromising, right? Both sides want to hold very steadily to their position and neither of them wants to budge. Neither of them wants to find common ground. Some people do, most of them do not. So that is why, you know, it's harder to have that minority influence today. When Democrats are in power, they will pass what they want. When Republicans are in power, they'll pass what they want, okay? Right now it's Democrats who are kind of in control and uh, they're gonna pass the stuff that they wanna pass as long as they have the numbers. And as long as they get everybody's support that's on their side, they'll be able to do that. In the past it was Republican. So yeah, we go back and forth and things change, okay? Uh, let me give you another example of this uh, that has to do with history. You know this, uh, yeah, I keep coming back to the whole issue about uh, racism and stuff like that. Uh, it, it's important. As we know, in this country, <clears throat> black people have always been in the minority. There's always been a lot more white people. And we know that there's been a lot of racism in the past and there's still racism today, but things have gotten better, okay? In the past, black people were slaves, right? And even when they were emancipated, when they were freed, they were not allowed to, allowed to uh, vote. They were not allowed to hold office. They're not allowed to own property and things got better little by little, you know, a little, uh, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. And eventually, you know, we are where we are today, right? They can vote, they can own property. They have a lot of the same rights. There's still discrimination and racism, but this, things have gotten a lot better. How did that happen over time, right? How did the minority have that influence? How is it that black people were heard, you know, and they had influence that, hey, we deserve the right to vote too. We also deserve the right to own property and the right to basically what it says in the constitution. How did that happen? Well, of course, you hold steady to your views, right? That's important, right? And of course, uh, there, you know, that has been happening. You know, people have been, and black people have been saying things all along that this is unfair, this is racist, whatever it is. And, you know, sometimes people listen, sometimes they don't, but you, we know what the position is, right? They never held the majority of the position, right? Never have, but they've had influence in other ways. Willing to compromise a little bit, right? Um, I'm not aware of too many compromises because I'm, I'm not, I don't know that much about the, uh, the details about the, the exact things, right? The, the compromises that were made on a political level. Because I'm not a historian, but I do know that, yes, civil rights legislation and all kinds of things was passed. All kinds of things were passed, right? That are, you know, bet now that things have gotten better for black people, for women, for all sorts of people. By the way, civil rights helps everybody, okay? It's, uh, it basically just means that everybody should have the same rights, okay? But to be treated fairly equally when it comes to voting, property, whatever it is, right? Uh, the law, right? All that stuff. To have at least some support from others, that's important. Yes, black people had some support from others. There were some white people who basically supported them and say, you know what, they're right. At first, it was just a small number of white people, but over time that grew. And now most people believe in the message. Right? Most people believe that yes, diversity is a good thing. Yes, it's important to have civil rights. Yes, it's important to protect the right to vote and for everybody to have equal access to voting and all sorts of things like that. Most people are on board now, but in the past, it was only a few people who came on board. And as more people came on board, things really got rolling and things have changed. And I think it's still moving in that direction, by the way. Not everybody believes in that, but that's what has happened, right? In other words, you know, you have to get some white people on your side, right? You can't just think of the other side as the enemy. Some of them will help you. Some of them will be willing to compromise with you and will get you where you know where you need to go. And, and, and actually, to, I could be a little bit more cynical about that. Just tell you a little bit more bluntly about a lot of things. Minority groups, whether we're talking about Black people, Asian, Latinos, whatever it is, they've been complaining for a long time about this and that, right? And you know the, the reality, right, of, of the way things work? Until white people get on board and decide to support them, nothing changes. Until white people decide, you know what? I think they have a point. I think they're right. 
that is when the law actually changes. What that is when things actually change. White people are the majority, and if they don't support you, uh, the laws are not going to change. It's not going to pass. Okay, that is the reality. Is that only, only in this country, only when white people step in and say yes, this matters. We should change this. Only then do things change, and that is the reality. Okay. <clears throat> So you should not always you should not you should not think of other people as just your enemy, right? You need other people. You need to find common ground with other people. You need to find support if you're in the minority and you want to get somewhere. You can't just always think of the majority as the enemy, the other side, right? Some of them will be willing to help you, and as more people help you, then things will really change, right? And that's how you get minority influence. Now let's talk about groupthink. Uh, groupthink is uh, in some ways similar to group polarization, where you, uh, group polarization is when you have a, an extreme viewpoint, right, that is biased. Groupthink is a very bad decision. It's basically when you make a decision where everyone is thinking the same. That's why it's called groupthink. It's like the group as a, well, let's just say, it, it's like one person is doing the thinking. It's like the group all thinks one way, okay? So group thinking is a group decision marked by uh, a, a group decision uh, making character, okay, uh, characterized by a greater, uh, uh, there's some bad wording there, characterized by a greater sense of desire among group members to get along and agree with one another rather than to generate critical, rather than to generate and critically evaluate alternative viewpoints. Let me say that another way. Group think is a decision that comes about a result that comes about when people just want to agree and get along with each other rather than to think carefully about doing the right thing. That's groupthink. It's when everybody just wants to jump on board and agree, and then they end up making a stupid decision, to tell you the truth, to be blunt, because they didn't listen to the alternatives. They didn't really want to make the right decision. They just wanted to agree and just, and just uh, you know, have their agenda, so to speak, you know? They didn't listen to the other side. So group think is when people, when groups just make a decision without really thinking about it that much. And we'll, let, we're gonna go through the process of how this works. Group, group think can cause groups to lose the benefits of group discussion. Having a group to make decisions is better than one person making a decision. When you have a group, you have different voices. You have more analysis of the information, different people, uh, looking at the same thing, thinking about it, making their arguments. Hopefully you come up with a better decision. But sometimes that is lost because of groupthink, where groups basically uh, just want to get along and agree, and they don't really discuss things, and they end up making a bad decision. That's groupthink. And what is it that leads to that? Well, here's the thing, and this should sound very familiar. If you've been paying any attention to history lately, if you paid any attention to what happened in the last administration, to what happened with the last president we had, Right, and yes, I'll say his name, Donald Trump. This happened over and over again, okay? Um, here's what happens. When you have group characteristics where you have directive leadership, right? In other words, you have a leader who wants things to be done a certain way and it's my way or you get the hell out of here, right? That's one thing, one group characteristic that can lead to group think. And that was exactly Donald Trump. It's like, if you disagree with him, he fires you. He gets rid of you and he appoints somebody else who will agree with him. That's what he did. He very strong position. He wants things done a certain way. He wants certain things and you're not allowed to contradict him. That's directive leadership. It's almost like you're basically, you have uh, basically a, uh, how should I say a, a um, what's the word? Uh, someone who's very authoritarian, a dictator basically, who just wants things done his way. And if you oppose him, you're out of here, okay? The whole thing, you're fired, right, kind of thing. Yes, it applies to his administration as well. He fired a bunch of people who would dare question him, right? Would dare disagree with him. That's directive leadership, okay? Uh, when you also have interpersonal cohesiveness, when the group members kind of like each other and they want to get along, that's another characteristic. And when they are, they are isolated from outside influences. In other words, when they're very insulated and they don't listen to the outside, right? They don't listen to what's happening out there. They don't listen to other voices. That's how it starts. You have a very strong leader who wants things done a certain way. And if you don't agree, you're out of here. 
People want to fit in, they want to get along, and they're not going to listen so much to the outsiders. That's how, that's how it starts. And that's exactly what we had before. And then after that, that leads to uh, uh, more of a desire to seek agreement and group collegiality. That leads to uh, members just wanting to fit in, to get along, to get with the program, so to speak. When you have a leader who's going to fire you, right, who's going to get rid of you if you don't fall in line, if you don't agree with him, then everybody just tries to agree and tries to and just tries to get along. It's like we better play nice here. We all have to agree. And that's that is sending you on the path to group thing, right? That so those group characteristics lead to desire to seek uh, agreement and group collegiality. And then that also leads to a psychological state there of group members where they perceive pressure to conform to the leader's perspective and center their own views. In other words, you have to agree with the leader. And if you have objections, you have other opinions, you keep them to yourself. You, are, you don't speak out because you know what's gonna happen to you if you speak out, they're gonna get rid of you, okay? There's a perceived need also to protect the leader for contrary views, right? There's this perceived need uh, by people close to the leader that the people who disagree, even if they're the members of their own party, right, that those people should not even be heard. They should not have the president's ear, so to speak. And they try to insulate the person, the, the president, the person, the leader from whoever disagrees, even if it's within their own group. Okay, they're going to protect them. And that's what happens when you have that inner circle of people who just protects the leader at all costs. The leader is not even allowed to hear that he's wrong or that there's another alternative or that maybe that shouldn't happen. Not gonna happen, right? Illusions of invulnerability uh, and outside, of outsiders of in, uh, as inferior, right? In other words, we have the majority, we can do whatever we want. The outsiders, those people, right? Uh, the Democrats, right? Uh, they're stupid, they don't know what they're doing. And you know, and they're not going to get their way. And that's exactly what was happening with Trump. Not only, uh, not only disagree, did he disagree with people, the people he disagreed with, he called stupid, inferior, uh, whatever it is, inadequate. He said some very, very mean and nasty things about them. And that's what happens when you think you are invulnerable. You have the majority. You are totally protective, insulated, and outsiders, people who disagree, whether they're in your own group or the other party, they're thought of in very bad way. Inferior, stupid, worthless, whatever it is. Don't listen to them. Even within your own party, those people who disagree, well, maybe they shouldn't be in your group, right? That's what they, that's what they think. And they try to get rid of those people. That leads to a defective discussion process. There is, it really isn't much discussion. There's an, an incomplete survey of the objectives and alternatives. They don't really think about things that much. It's like, this is what we want to do, and this is what we're going to do. What about this other stuff? This, no, none of that gets discussed. It's like you agree with the leader, okay? And you make what he wants happen at all cost. If there's people who disagree, those people, you get rid of them, and you get people who do agree, and who, people who are willing to do what you want. And that's exactly what was happening. So they don't really talk about the alternatives. They don't discuss all the points that there are to be discussed. There's a failure to consider negative features of the chosen alternative. There's a failure to consider, uh, you know, the uh, situation of, uh, or the, um, just the out, the, or, or just the, um, the fact that they may be wrong. They don't talk about that. What if we're wrong? What if what we do isn't the right thing? What if this whole thing fails? That doesn't get discussed. They just think it's gonna work, they're gonna get their way, and it's the best thing. And there's no contingency plan, right? That's the la last thing there. No contingency plan. What if we fail? What do we do then? What if this doesn't work, right? What about this? What about if, uh, what about if, uh, if, 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 uh, if this whole thing fails, right? This uh, minimizing of, uh, of COVID as a real emergency, this uh, basically you keep saying that it's not that much of a problem, that we don't have to do this or that, or we don't have to listen to the science, things like that. What if we're wrong? What do we do then? What if a bunch of people do die and a bunch of people get infected and it does destroy the economy? They didn't wanna hear any of that. And 
that leads to, of course, to increased likelihood of a poor decision. And that is groupthink. That is the process. That is what happens when you have a very strong leader who wants things a certain way and people just wanna agree and get along and they don't listen to outside voices. They don't consider the facts. They don't consider the science. They just want to do whatever they wanna do. And it leads to very bad decisions. And for the Trump president, that very bad decision was all the decisions that were made with COVID. Not all of them, but um, the thing about minimizing the danger of it, right? Saying that it's just gonna disappear right? Not listening to the experts, the medical experts and the scientists who are telling him you need to do this, this, and this, right? And even now, continuing to deny the effectiveness of vaccines and, 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 and a certain, and doesn't, even now when he's out of office, doesn't want to encourage people to take out the vaccine, right? That's all very bad decision-making, right? That's what happens when you have a group of people who just want to agree with the leader and they don't really discuss things fully. You make bad decisions, sometimes very stupid decisions that will end your presidency. And that's exactly what happened to Trump. Had he listened, had they discussed everything the way they should have, they would have made better decisions. He would still be in office, I guarantee you. He barely lost the last election. If he would have handled COVID correctly, he'd still be president. And there's been other examples, really bad decisions of disastrous wars, disastrous things that have happened in history where people just don't really think about things the way they should in the group. They just wanna go along with whatever the leader wants and outside voices are silenced one way or another. Let's keep going. Um, okay, so that was, uh, that was all about groupthink. Let's talk about something else. So gaining positions of leadership. So now we're getting into another goal, another goal of, uh, joining groups, why would people wanna join groups? Uh, often people want to lead the group. They wanna be in charge. That's another reason why people join groups. There, are, co there are, all, are costs and benefits to being the leader of a group, whether you're a president or the leader of an organization, of a company, uh, of a college, whatever it is. Whenever you're the, a leader, there's costs and benefits. Costs involve things like time investment. When you're the leader, it means you're gonna have a lot to do. A lot of people that are going to want to talk to you, a lot of meetings. There's a lot of responsibilities when you're the leader. Okay. Yeah. A lot of responsibility to others. When you're the leader, you're responsible for those other people, right? Those other people in your group. If bad things happen to them, it's your fault, right? You're the leader. You're the one who led them in that direction. And you're the president. You're responsible for what happens in the country. And all those hundreds of thousands of people that died under your watch, you're responsible for that. Maybe not for every single one, but for a vast majority of that because of the bad decision-making, okay? You are responsible as the leader. You get the blame. When you're the president, you get the blame. When things don't go well, you don't get reelected. If you're a CEO of the company and the company goes down the drain, they get rid of you, okay? You're to blame when things go wrong. And that means you get the ax. You're the one who, is, who they get rid of. Uh, when you're the leader, also you're gonna see hear a lot of criticism and complaints. Whether you are the president, the CEO of a company, uh, you know, the superintendent of schools or whatever it is, when you're at the top, there's always going to be a bunch of people who are gonna disagree with you and criticize you no matter what. Even if you're doing the right thing, there's always gonna be opposition. There's gonna be a lot of people who support you no matter what, and there's gonna be a lot of people who are against you no matter what. It doesn't matter whether you're good or bad. If Even if you're good, a lot of people will not agree with you. In this country, we are so polarized, right? So uh, divided. If we have a Democratic president, what will happen is most of the Democrats will agree with that president and what he's doing, and most of the Republicans will disagree. And that's just the way it is. It doesn't matter whether it's a good president or not they will still have a lot of opposition. Now, when they're a better president, when they're a good president, more people, a bigger percentage of people will agree with them, over 50%. But when they're a really bad president, there'll be a larger position, a larger portion of people who will disagree with them, but there will always be a core group of people, which is about a third of the country that will support you no matter what, just as long as you're on their side, as long as you have the same party affiliation, they will always stick with you, even if you're the worst president they will still support you and vote for you. But if you lose part of your support of your base, you're not gonna get reelected. 
okay? And by the way, with the last things that Trump did while he was in office, the inciting of the insurrection and things like that, he's lost some of the support of Republicans. In my opinion, if he runs again, he will lose badly. He has a bunch of people who support him, but he's lost maybe 10, 15%, and that's enough for you to lose by a lot, okay? Because the other side, they're all gonna oppose you. You're gonna lose those people. People are not gonna vote for you. And if you lose a portion of your people, you have no chance. So if I were to advise him, I'd say, don't run again. You're not gonna, you're not gonna win. But uh, then again, of course, he's not. He's going to do whatever the heck he wants. But why would he listen to me? Anyway, that's just my opinion. But anyway, that's what happens when you're the leader. It doesn't matter whether you're the greatest leader. Okay? There will always be people who hate you, who are against you, no matter what. Okay? There's also benefits, of course, to being the leader. Recognition for group successes, right? When the group does achieve great things, good things, when good things happen, you are recognized for that. It's like you get the credit. It's a good economy. We have a good president. Or, you know, or look, the stock market is up. Yay for the president, right? As the leader, you get the recognition. You get the credit. You get the blame when things go wrong, but you get the credit when things go right. Sometimes you are to blame when things go wrong, but you still, and, you know, and sometimes you're not, but you will get the blame either way. And it's the same thing when things go well. Sometimes, it's because of what you did and sometimes it's not, but either way you will be recognized for it because you're in charge. Uh, you also get high social status when you're the leader, right? You are looked up to, you are admired, right? Sometimes it comes with uh, higher salaries, more wealth, right? Uh, more access to resources, better treatment, all sorts of things. There's a lot of benefits to being a leader, okay? But there's also a lot of costs. It's very stressful, it's very time consuming, it's very hard to be a leader, but you also get a lot more money, more recognition, more status, a lot better treatment, at least from the people who, who are under you, okay? And that's the reality about being a leader and not everyone wants to be a leader. So who wants to lead? Who wants to lead? Those who need, who have a need for power, okay? Those who, that desire, those who have a desire to win prestige, to have more status, to have more influence over others, those are said to have a need for power. Those are people who wanna lead more. There are certain people who just want to be president, who want to be the CEO or who want to be the boss or whatever. Certain people have a greater need to lead. They wanna be in charge. It's more of a, a personality thing. Some people like that power. They want the dominance, they want the influence, okay? And some people uh, become leaders for a different reason. Some people want become leaders because they have a need for achievement. It's not always that they want the status and the power, but it's because they want, they want the right things to happen. They want to, uh, they want to make sure that the group is successful. Sometimes people have a desire to, uh, you know, to do something exceptionally well for its own sake. Sometimes the leader just wants to make sure the company succeeds, that the college gets better. Sometimes the leader just wants to make sure that the country gets better. There are people who lead for those reasons, and there are people who lead just because they want power. But of course, there are plenty of leaders who want both. They want the power and they also want things to go well. They also want to do, well, not, that's not to go, to go well, it's the wrong way of saying it. They want power, but they also want the country, the group to succeed. So yes, you could have both, but you could be purely one or the other. There's some people who just want power and who are just power hungry. And there's some people who just want things to succeed but there's plenty of people who want both. More about who wants to lead in a study of workers around the world. Um, research showed that men are more interested in power. It has to do with the whole status, dominance, testosterone, that kind of stuff, right? Which men have a lot more of, and that leads to men wanting more status, more power, more authority. Men are more interested in leadership, self-realization, reaching the top, that kind of stuff, much more so than women. Men have a greater need to be in charge. It's kind of like part of it, their biology has a lot to do with it. More women want power than, than, than more men want power than women. More men want to lead than women, okay? Um, women are more interested in the quality of life and relationship between people. Women care more about those things and people who are interested in those things can also be really good presidents. They want people to get along. They want things to get done, right? 
that's good. It's good to have a president like that too. But most of the time, it will be men who run for office. It will be men who want to be in charge. And that's part of the reason there are more men as leaders. A lot of it also has to do with discrimination. There are plenty of women who want to lead, but often they don't get the chance because it is a very male dominant society, country, world, right? Men dominate just about everywhere. And yes, there's discrimination, okay? Whoever's in power wants to stay in power and keep people in power who are like them. But yes, women do wanna lead, but uh, not as much as men. But there's other things about, you know, uh, that to do with uh, who gets to lead, right? Who actually gets to lead, whether you want to or not, who gets to be in a position of power, position of authority? Group leaders, uh, you know, the people who get to lead are group leaders who, who meet the current group's needs. One thing is what does the group need to do and who can best achieve it? That's one thing, right? If the person is the best one, the best person to achieve those goals, then that person will get to lead hopefully, right? That's one thing that matters. But there's other things that matter that are more superficial when it comes to who gets to lead, right? Which I'll, I'll mention in a moment. But when the needs of the group change, different types of leaders may be desirable. When things are going well, research has shown that when things are going well, the economy is going good, you know, going well and things are okay, that Americans tend to choose uh, less dominant presidents. What does that mean? Um, during good times, uh, we're more likely to elect Democrats. Republicans are more dominant. Republicans, it's like, it's more like, you know, uh, like you pull yourself up on your own bootstraps. If somebody attacks us, we fight back. We destroy the enemy. They have a tougher mindset. They're more dominant, Republicans, usually. So guess what? During times of war, when things go bad, they're more likely to elect a Republican. If there is an enemy that scares the hell out of Americans, a Republican will be elected to deal with it. Not so much Democrats. De I mean, Republicans are more pro-military, more pro-use of force, more, uh, they believe more in punishment, right? More in being dominant. You know, uh, like my well, my way or the, or the highway kind of thing. It's like, uh, this is what we believe in this, uh, believe in this country and this is the way things should be, right? Democrats are a little bit different. They're more, you know, they're a little bit nicer, so to speak. They're not as dominant, but you could say they're not as mean, okay? Uh, but the country will elect tougher people, meaner people, people who are just more aggressive during times of crisis, during war, especially, okay? So sometimes what some groups try to do or political campaigns try to do is they try to, uh, sometimes what happens, sometimes Republicans, Republican campaigns will try to create fear in the American people, fear of an enemy, fear of war, right? Of terrorism, fear of outsiders, of immigrants, fear of, uh, of minorities, of people who are not white, not Christian, not this or that, right? Fear of those people in order to get elected because they know that that works, that, in, that if they are successful, a Republican is more likely to be elected. It's a scare tactic, right? They know that, uh, yes, if uh, when you are scared, when you face a threat uh, during times of war, Republicans are more likely to be elected. That doesn't mean that they're the best to deal with war, by the way, okay? It's, it's the perception that they are tougher and they'll be able to handle it better, but doesn't mean that they get, that they do, okay? More about who gets to lead. Uh, it's not just those things and not just the group's needs, but also about certain things that have to do with the image of a leader. And this is where the, you know, discrimination and racism comes in. More of the discrimination, just keep it more general, right? Uh, someone who looks like a leader, right, is more likely to be elected as a leader, more likely to be elected as a president. Usually it means the person has high expertise. That means the person knows what he's doing, right? If you, you want a president who has expertise, who knows how to run things, right? Who knows how to run a country, an organization or something like that. It's often people who are, uh, who have been leaders and other things that get to basically become leaders of the country. But you want them to have some expertise when it comes to leading things. Confident, people who are very confident, people who believe in themselves, have high self-esteem, okay? That's another thing. High participation in a group, you know, people who are very involved. And the last thing is the, where the discrimination comes in, the right look and height. The, 
reality is that people perceive people who are taller as more likely to be a leader, people who are male as more effective leaders, uh, and people who are white. That's, that's the reality, okay? Uh, this is the US, by the way. I'm talking about the US. Yes, the majority of people here are white. So if you are tall, white, male, dominant, right? You're more likely to get elected than if you are a woman who is, you know, than if you're a woman. You know, you might be an expert, confident, uh, have a lot of high participation in the group in the country, right? You've done a lot of things, but you don't look so much like the typical leader. Women are a big disadvantage when it comes to being leaders because people perceive leaders in a certain way because it's what we're used to. It's what has happened over time. It's been almost nothing but males whether, and, and white males, whether you're talking about the CEO of a company, a president, or whatever it is. We're used to seeing people, uh, that people who are leaders look a certain way and people who don't fit that description are a lot less likely to get elected to office. So some of these image factors, the last one there, like height, may lead groups to choose a man uh, more than a competent woman, right? More likely to choose a woman who is really competent and smart and really knows what she's doing over a man who just looks a certain way, who just looks tough. And let me give you my opinion. That's exactly what happened when Donald Trump got elected. They chose someone who looks more like a leader, a tall, white, dominant male, over a very smart, capable woman. I'm not saying that she was perfect. She was not. She was very controversial. But Donald Trump won for a large part because of that, because being a tall, white, dominant male makes you more electable. Women are always at disadvantage when it comes to wanting positions of leadership. And of course, so are people of color or anyone of any diversity, right? It's hard to break the kind of the, the norm, so to speak, right? and convince people that you can also be a good leader, you can also lead when you don't look like the person who usually leads. Yes, a lot of it is superficial and shallow. You know, what do people say? They wanna elect someone, they want, they want someone who's a real American, right? Someone who's a, you know, someone who's a, you know, uh, you know who really, uh, you know, fits who they think of as a leader. That usually means, means a tall white male, a dominant male. That's the reality, right? But other things matter too, like competence. And yes, the last president we had, to give you my opinion, he was very incompetent, okay, in my opinion. But a lot of people loved him, but he was really incompetent, okay? If he would have been a little bit more competent, he would still be in office. <clears throat> it wasn't hard, okay? He should have gotten elected again. I'm not, I mean, if he would have done just a little bit better, I'm not saying that, you should vote for him is what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is if he would have done just a little bit better, he would have gotten elected easily. It should have been easy, but he really screwed up that one very important thing. He screwed up lots of things, but he especially screwed up that, the whole COVID thing. And that's why he lost. He was so incompetent when it comes to that. All the talk of the conspiracy theories that, you know, and all this stuff that's going to go away, all this nonsense of denial of the, of the, of the epidemic, of the science and all that stuff. It's really stupidity to tell you the truth, but that's what happens when they don't have people around him who are gonna tell him the truth. Too much protecting of the leader and not wanting to hear the reality of what's really the truth, right? Insulating the leader from outside opinion. Too much belief in conspiracy th theories and all this stuff, all this nonsense, right? Um, bad, very anti-science guy, by the way. Okay, anyways, um, what, when are leaders effective? Let's talk about this. Let's talk about when leaders are effective. The best leadership style may actually depend on the task at, at hand, right? The best leader depends on what needs to be done. Workers in conventional occupations, workers in jobs that have to do with um, conventional jobs, like basically accountants uh, or, you know, construction workers, or your usual kind of jobs where, where you have people who, who uh, who do certain kind of jobs where, where basically they have leadership, they have management people above them and that tell them what to do, the plans to carry out, right? Uh, they respond very well to task-oriented and authoritative leadership. Those kind of, most jobs actually are that kind. They're conventional where 
if you and if you have good strong leadership the workers will be more productive okay but workers in other kinds of jobs that are more investigative more that's do with like being a professor being a scientist um, that kind of stuff more research based those kind of people need different kind of leadership they prefer to manage themselves let me explain because there was a study that was done okay students in one study were assigned to work on hobbies in groups they, they were assigned to work on something in groups okay the groups were assigned leaders who were, the, were either were either autocratic or democratic an autocratic leader is a group is a leader that tells members what to do and when to do it, how to do it. That very strong authoritarian leader, right? I want this done and I want it done this way and that kind of stuff. It's almost like a dictator, very strong leader, okay? You know, like that last president we had, Trump, that he's that kind of leader. Or when you have a boss, right? Who's just very tough, very opinionated, like things need to be done this way. This is what I want to get done. This is the way it's going to do. This is what's going to happen and you need to do this or I'm going to fire you, that kind of leader. There are countries, by the way, that have very authoritarian leader, leaders, and it usually means they have a dictator, and the person is like a king or a ruler. Those are autocratic leaders, right? They have a very strong voice and opinion, a lot of power, and they want to get things done the way they want them done, okay? They like to tell people what to do and when to do it, how to do it, that kind of stuff, that kind of leadership, very strong, tough leadership, if you want to think about it that way. And then there are leaders that are more democratic, that will listen more to the group and have more discussion. So how do, how do people, when do workers do best? What kind of leadership? Well, the researchers then recorded the time students spent working on a task when the leader was present or absent. So how hard do the workers work when the leader's there? And how hard do they work when the leader's not there? Here's what we found, okay. Um, Autocratic leader, that's the bar in white, right? Uh, democratic leader, that's the bar in, uh, I guess, gray. And then we have uh, on the scale there, the vertical line, the percentage of time working on the task. So you can see there that uh, when the leader was there to supervise them, groups with autocratic leaders spent more time on the task. People work harder when they have a strong leader and that leader is there, basically. The leader is present and breathing down your neck and you can see him and you better work and you better work hard or there are consequences, okay? Those kind of leaders get better results, you know, when they're present, right? When the leader is present, okay? Uh, democratic leaders who favor discussion a little bit more, more compromise, more give and take, the workers don't work as hard, even when the leader's there, because he's nicer, more discussion, more, you know, listens to the opinions of others more, and you don't fear that leader as much. So you're not really gonna work as hard even when that person is there. Here's a surprising thing though. When the leader is absent, what about when the leader is not there? When the, so you look at the, the bars on the, on the right, the last two bars on the right, where it's the under, you know, above leader absent, right? When the leader is not there, right? If you have an autocratic leader, when he's not there, all of a sudden people work a lot less they take a breather, they don't work as hard. When the boss is there, you work really hard, you bust your butt, right? But when the boss is out and it's just the workers there, all right, we can take a breather now, we can relax, we don't have to work as hard, right? Uh, you know, let's relax, let's not work as hard. That's what happens. And um, I've seen it and I've heard about it over and over again. When you have a construction crew, when the boss is there, they work really hard and fast, and it's a tough job, construction. But when something happens and the boss gets a call that something is happening, maybe some issue with his wife, his kids, and he has to leave and leave the workers there unsupervised, you know what happens then? The workers work a lot less. Sometimes they'll even stop working. I have seen them. They, they might be working on a roof. When the boss leaves, all of a sudden, you'll see them sitting on that roof talking, doing nothing. Sometimes they start having a beer, right? Yeah, often there's a lot of Latinos who work in construction. That's a stereotype, right? That they even drink on the job, right? But that's what happens with a lot of people who have those, those types of jobs. When you're, the boss is there, you work really hard. When the boss is not there, it's like you work, not, you work a lot less. 
And something that could be done in a day will probably take a week if they work at that pace. But it's different when you have a democratic leader. When you have a democratic leader, workers still work just as hard. Whether that person is absent or there, it doesn't matter. You prefer to manage yourself uh, when, you have, when you have a job that has to do with science, research, a professor, and you're gonna do whatever you do, whether, whether the boss is there or not. You work just as hard. That's the job that I have, I'm a professor. It doesn't matter whether the dean passes by my class or stops by my office, I'm gonna be doing the exact same thing. I work the way I work. When you're doing science, research, same kind of thing. You know how to do your job and you do your job. You don't need someone breathing down your neck telling you to work harder. And you're not gonna work harder if someone's breathing down your neck. And you're not gonna work any less hard when they're not there. So those different kinds of jobs require different kind of leadership is what I'm saying. And uh, yeah, being a professor, well, it's a very good job. And uh, for the most part, uh, they trust us to do what we're doing. They do evaluate us, but we know what, what we're doing. We're the experts in our areas. We know what we know uh, where we have, uh, you know, a lot of education in the area and we're the experts. The administrator could come by and look at us, but what the hell does he know about economics or about psychology? He, there might not be his area. He just wants to make sure that we're working or still there, but he really, he really doesn't need to. There are things in place. We do get evaluated every once in a while, but for the most part, we're experts. We know what we're doing and they let us basically manage ourselves. But if you're another kind of job, construction, accounting, whatever it is, the boss is usually breathing down your neck, get this done by this time, work harder, right? But when he's not there, big sigh of relief and you don't work as hard. And that's the last slide, you guys. So I will uh, stop recording.